let me start my talk here by spending a few moments telling a story about Carlos Lara. So Carlos uh, was born in Mexico. Uh, his family moved uh, to Texas at a, at a young, when he was a young boy. His father uh, didn't speak English very well, opened up a general store catering to the Hispanic community. So that's where Carlos sort of got uh, firsthand experience with entrepreneurship and, and retail. Uh, he ended up, when he was uh, a young man, did a lot of work. His first real job, as it were, was in high-end men's fashion retail, you know, working at high-end department stores, things. Business people would come in, want to get a nice tailored suit and so on. He was, you know, the guy that would take your measurements and, and set you up. So that's what his experience was. He did a brief stint uh, in the Marine Corps, and I just want to take a detour and tell you that story just so you get a sense of, of his personality and the kind of guy he is. Um, so after completing, you know, the, the service requirements, he was then in the reserves, and they had to report back, I, I think it was once a month, and they still, the regulations at the time required that they had the Marine, you know, buzz cut. So this was in the 70s, and he was a consultant at this point in terms of his day job, and so that was a bit awkward for him if he's, you know, meeting with clients and they're all dressed up in nice suits, then he's got this really short haircut. It just wasn't the style at the time. So he let his hair grow out long. He and a couple other guys um, in his group, and what they would do is when they had to report back to the Marines periodically, they would get these wigs, and so they'd stuff their, you know, real hair up under these, these, these wigs and have it look like the short haircut. And then I don't know if it was him or one of his buddies, but they got caught. You know, the drill sergeant's going down, and he caught one of them. He's, what is this? And then he saw a bunch of them, so they're in big trouble. And of course, you know, the Marines weren't saying, oh, well, we we're very sympathetic. Why don't you tell us how you feel about this? And that's not what happened, right? It was, what are you doing? Shave your head, you know, get, get in line. What are you doing? He didn't like that. He said, no, this is going to hurt my business. So what did he do? I think what most of us would have done, he sued the Marine Corps, took him to court. <laughs> and, uh, and the way Carlos tells the story is, the, the, you know, he, he hears the, the opposing thing, and the judge just called the counsel up and he said, come here. And they went to his quarters, and he gives the wig to Carlos, says, put this on. Let me see this thing. And so Carlos, you know, sticks his hair in there. And the judge just burst out laughing. For some reason, he just thought this was hilarious. <laughs> And he said, yeah, they don't need to cut their hair. Come on, this is fine. So anyway, that's, that was, uh, the, I just, like I say, I like telling that story just to get an idea of who he is. Um, so anyway, the, the, where I'm going with this is Carlos ends up becoming um, a very high-end consultant. And what he ended up getting into, drawing on the, the strains of his experience, he was what's called a workout specialist. And this was in the, you know, the mid-1970s when his business really took off. And so what would happen is department stores would get into financial trouble They'd be pushing a lot of high-end men's fashion, and then the, they would just get into trouble. Uh, they'd be get behind, you know, they'd owe money to the suppliers, and so then the suppliers would be nervous, and they would wonder, do we keep shipping product to this particular outlet? Because they were sort of in a catch-22. If we cut them off, they're going to go under for sure, and we're not going to get paid back for what they're, you know, they're already 90 days late, that kind of thing. But if we keep shipping them stuff then maybe they're just gonna dig a bigger hole for themselves. And so what happened is eventually Carlos got a reputation among the suppliers, you know, that they would send him out to a location, he would get on the scene, he would assess the situation, figure out what is it, is it just like a family business and the dad's retiring and the kids don't know what they're doing or what's going on. So he would assess, is this a good business model and they just need to get tightened up and have someone kinda keeping them disciplined or is it just let it, let it collapse? And so in the cases where he thought it was salvageable and they just need someone kind of you know, keeping their feet to the fire. He would come in, he would talk to the bank, get them to back off because they would typically have a lien on all the property. He would talk to the suppliers, get them to keep shipping product, get the business you know, going, and then they would finally dig out of a hole. And so he, he just got to be really good at that. And like I say, the suppliers would be the ones eventually when they would have a distribution outlet that was in trouble, they would call Carlos and send him out to, to look at it and see what happened. So what ended up happening, though, is for various reasons, the way the industry progressed, it got to the point where for Carlos to execute one of these workout deals, more and more as the, as the 70s progressed, he had to sort of personally guarantee the deal. So he would say to the suppliers, if this goes south, you know, I think this is going to be fine, but if it goes south, you know what, I'm on the hook here for this product, I'll, I'll pay you back. And he was relying on bank letters of credit in order to finance that. So typically, if everything went fine, you know, he was fine. But then what happened is with the economy being bad in the late 70s, remember interest rates spiked. It got to the point where at the worst of it, Carlos personally owed commercial banks $5 million when interest rates were 21%. All right, so you can do the math on that. That's not a good position to be in. So that sort of hit him like a ton of bricks. And 
it, it just to see the, the turnaround before then, he had been getting ready to retire, I think, in his 30s, you know, as a, as a multimillionaire. To give you a frame of reference, he was living in Nashville, and he had built what was at that time one of the like top 10 nicest houses in Nashville. So if you know Nashville, there's a lot of you know wealthy people there. So that was a, a pretty big deal. So to go from that to then all of a sudden he gets hit with this huge calamity, this hole that he was in, that didn't cripple him. He, he managed to sort of dig out of that. Then the next whammy that hit him was after the 1986 Tax Reform Act, he had been invested with a lot of his business partners in a lot of what you know we call real estate shelters. That all got taken away. Real estate, as many of you may remember, got crushed at that point. Another you know, huge hit to him. And so it took him a long time to, to dig out of that. So why am I telling you all this? Because as a result of these two things, Carlos realized, I don't understand how the economy works. That you know, He was, is a very sharp guy. He had all kinds of tax professionals, other sorts of advisors, you know, subscribed to all the financial news publications and so on. And both of those events, the interest rate spike, and then what happened with the stock market and the real estate market in 86, 87, he, it's not just that he wasn't ready for it, he just had no clue that was even a possibility. All right? And so he realized that you know, my, and he, was, he had all those, you know, the, the certifications and things with the various financial um, certifications you could get, and yet this stuff wasn't on his radar at all. So he realized business people in the United States, you know, business owners and so on, we're not getting a good financial education. I need to figure out what just happened to me. This is crazy. So he went on a sort of a personal mission, and he discovered uh, what's called Austrian economics, and in particular the work of Ludwig von Mises. So that's who I'm going to be spending the balance of my time talking about here. But I just want to explain the connection. In particular, what Carlos discovered was Mises' theory of the business cycle. So I'll give you the real quick version here just to round out the story. In Mises' view, it's not that the ups and downs of the market are up, oh, that's just capitalism for you. No, Mises said that's government intervention for you. That in particular, when the government, typically in modern times operating through a central bank, encourages an influx of artificial credit that pushes down interest rates, a lot of the public and many analysts and professional economists also think that that's stimulating the economy, that you're doing a favor to the economy, you're encouraging prosperity in the upswing, but in Mises' view, you're giving a false signal that the interest rate is a price, it means something, and so if the interest rate is pushed down below where it should be, you're not doing anybody any favors. You're setting up an unsustainable boom that's eventually going to crash. Right? So that was the basic mechanism, and Carlos spent a lot of time studying that. And the reason I know all that is that I actually am a, a, a co-author with Carlos. This was before I had facial hair, by the way. I look like I'm eight in this picture. And um, so this is, he, he found me. We were both were living in Nashville at the time. I had written a study guide to an economic treatise, and Carlos was using it because at the time he was working on a PowerPoint presentation. He was going around to commercial bankers and explaining to them how fractional reserve banking worked and basically telling them, so this was like 2008, telling them, you guys are blowing up the economy. And at the time, I thought that was kind of a crazy thing for him to do, but I didn't know the Marine story at that point. So in retrospect, no big deal. But... So this is the kind of guy he is, that he's, you know, he's a business person. It's, you know, he doesn't have any advanced degrees, but when he found something, he really wanted to get to the heart of it. And so now, is, in addition just to his consulting business, his, his day job, if you will, he's sort of like a man on a mission that he wants to tell others about the insights of you know, how the economy works because he realized the connection between economic knowledge and, and human liberty, that if people can't be sure – of their economic uh, foundations. If, you know, for all they know, next year the economy could crash and they're helpless, their savings might disappear, the bank might go down. In that sort of environment where you're feeling very vulnerable, you turn to the state to, you know, to be there as, as a as bulwark and to sort of bail you out if you get into trouble. And so, you know, Carlos saw the connection there and realized the way to achieve independence and human flourishing more broadly is also to educate people about the economy. So that's, that's my connection with him and, and the work I do with him. So let me, again, talk about this man Ludwig von Mises, who was the author of that business cycle theory, but there's a lot more that he did. And the reason I'm choosing him and the, the relevance for today's panel is that the Independent Institute, as, as David alluded to, has asked me, and I, I wrote a book called Choice. What this does is it takes Mises' um, magnum opus called Human Action and distills it down into 300-some pages that, with language that's accessible to an undergrad level. 
right? Because Mises' book is 900 some pages. It came out in 1949. It's arguably the most important economics book of the 20th century. It's certainly up there, depending on who you talk to. But yet it's it's hard to read, right? So there's a lot in there. And so we, you know, David and I were talking and, and he was saying, we really think there's a need. Too many people like the insights of what's called the Austrian School of Economics, Laud, Mises, and so on, but not that many people, especially undergrads at this point, are going to sit down and read human action cover to cover. So we need something to to fill a gap. So that's what, what Choice uh, does. And let me just spend a few minutes now in the balance of my time telling you other themes that are, are in the book. And I try to choose them in particular with relevance to the our topic today of, you know, how, there's a divided America and how do we how do we bridge the gap and reach out to people who may be on the other side of the ideological spectrum. So one of the major themes in Mises' book is the, the cycle of interventions. And the idea here is that the government, you know, there's a problem. People don't like something, some outcome of the market economy. And so how do you fix that? Oh, you just pass a law, right? There ought to be a law, right? And you just do that, problem solved, right? You just pass a law, punish people for doing the thing you don't like. And Mises pointed out that what, what often happens is there's unintended consequences that, yeah, maybe you can solve that one particular thing, but then it spawns other undesirable outcomes that are bad, even from the point of view of the interventionists, right? So it's not just that the outside economist from a free market perspective poo-poos what happened. It's that, no, even the public who supported the initial intervention agrees this new development is bad too, and we can't stop here. And so Mises says that there, you know, the, the policymakers have a choice. They can either continue down this path of further and further interventions, sort of playing whack-a-mole, or they can admit, yeah, we screwed up. We shouldn't have done that. So you guys know politicians. How often do they do the latter? No, usually they say, oh, that's not the free market's worse than we thought. Let's keep intervening. And they keep pushing it further and further. So the example Mises would often use was with price controls. So he said, uh, people want to help widows afford milk. So the government passes a measure saying that you can't charge more than such and such for milk, thinking, oh, therefore we're keeping it cheaper. But that has obvious consequences that any economist knows that now there's going to be a shortage, right? Because if, if the farmer can't get enough for the milk to cover his costs and the reasonable profit, he's going to switch to something else. So if you were trying to help poor households get access to cheap milk, you're not doing them any favors by passing a, a price ceiling measure that makes milk disappear from the shelves. And so then Mises says, what would they do in that case? The policymakers could just repeal the original intervention and let milk prices rise and the public would be mad. Or they could say, all right, well, let's control the prices of the things, you know, the farmer's expenses. Let's keep those down to try to make it profitable now to sell milk at the controlled price. And so, but of course, that just pushes the problem back. And the, the idea is, eventually either you're going to just keep intervening until you get full-blown outright top-down central planning or you can go back towards a market outcome a market economy so mises wasn't saying that once you do one intervention necessarily you end up with socialism his point was that the interventionist state the sort of third way that a lot of people championed saying oh yeah we don't like pure capitalism but we also don't like pure socialism let's just have this middle ground that gets the best of both worlds mises point was that that's unstable because again, you have these unintended consequences. And I think we see this, um, well, one thing is you, you see it in Venezuela. I mean, there it's just textbook example where once oil revenues collapsed, you know, they ran the printing press, I'm simplifying obviously here, but they ran the printing press, prices started rising, the currency started falling in the foreign exchange markets. The government, instead of admitting, oh yeah, we probably shouldn't have printed so much money, instead just, you know, seized foreign currency control and imposed currency controls, passed price control measures, so everything disappeared from the shelves. And so now you have this horrible human rights situation at this point where formerly middle-class households have to like cross the border just to get toilet paper, right? And so this is just a prime example of the sort of thing Mises talked about. Here in the United States, the most obvious relevant example of this dynamic would be with health care and health insurance. All right, I think we'll, we'll be talking about that more as we go on, so I won't dwell on it here. But again, the idea is the government comes in, does something to help to make health care or health insurance more affordable, and then that just brings in further unintended consequences. And so you go down this spiral to the point where a lot of people who in other contexts are pretty free market are now saying, maybe we should just have single payer, just have the government pay for everything. Right? They would never in a million years occur to them to say, let's have the government 
pay for cars or computers for everybody, but a lot of people are saying, let's go ahead and have the government just take over health care altogether to lower costs, right? And, and so the, the point is that we got to this situation because of all these other decades of prior intervention. Okay, another big theme in Mises' book is this notion of consumer sovereignty. So here, what, what he's talking about, and this sort of explains the passion with which Mises would write for the general public, right? So it wasn't just that Mises uh, had a passion for the market economy because, oh, if we you know, adjust these things, we'll get 3.2% more growth or something like that. It wasn't a technocratic thing. He really thought that this system was the one that best represented or served the interests of the general public, right? So it was sort of ironic that the socialists at uh, the, the turn of the you know, 19th going to the 20th century likes to classify and, and promote socialism as sort of economic democracy, right? They would say, oh, just like the, you know, we over, in, in the political realm, we overturned the aristocracy and we, we gave the vote to the people. So too, when it comes to the economy, why have the fat cat capitalists running the show? Let's have the people run it. And that's kind of what socialism is, right? So they just thought that was the logical fruition of the liberation of man from, you know, the elite few. And Mises pointed out that, no, it's, it's the other way around. Under socialism is where you have the elite few controlling everything and the masses, you know, you just go to the work that the, the superiors pick for you. You have no real freedom and the standard of living is going to be lower empirically. He said under capitalism is where you have true freedom and, and, and that actually the system caters to the common person, that it's mass production for the masses. So the particular mechanism for how, to, you know, how does this get implemented Mises said is that, yes, there's a, there's a profit and loss test under capitalism, and the entrepreneurs and the capitalists might seem to the superficial observer to be running the show, but actually they, they're ultimately subservient it to the consumers. And so to give you a silly example, if somebody who, if the, sh the major shareholders of a car company, if they really liked purple cars, and they said, you know what, because we like this is our favorite thing, we're just going to do nothing but make all purple cars, they have the legal ability to do that under capitalism, but they're not going to be the dominant car company for very long, right? They're going to go out of business, losing out market share to some other company that caters to what the actual customer wants, right? So yes, it is true that ultimately the businesses answer to the bottom line, if that's the way you want to think about it. But Mises' whole point was that that's not an arbitrary number, the way a lot of the socialists thought, that when the accountant comes in and says, ah, yes, we turned a profit last quarter, Mises thought that's socially significant. What that means is, you know, just think about it. When you earn a profit as a business, it means the money you spent on the factors of production is less than what you could transform those resources and sell them for and the money you got. And so in a real sense, in a very legitimate sense, you're sort of adding value if you want to think of it that way, that you're taking resources, transforming it into stuff that the public wants to spend more money on than you had to pay for the resources. And so that's sort of a signal that the public is okay with the way you use those resources. Because the price of the resources, you know, you have other entrepreneurs competing for them. And so if, if the public wanted those particular, uh, you know, that land or that iron ore or whatever, that labor to go into some other product, well, the entrepreneur over there selling to the public would be able to outbid you for those resources, right? So the price of the resources is like a signal from other entrepreneurs saying the public wants these resources in this outlet over here, and this is how much I can pay to sort of reserve them or to steer them this way. So in Mises' view, the profit and loss test, far from being arbitrary and something that just caters to the rich, is actually the mechanism by which we maintain freedom, right? You can open a, a business, any business you want. You don't need to get permission from somebody to open a business. You can go work anywhere you want. If you're a resource owner, you can sell to whoever you want. And the public, by the same token, you get paid your wages or whatever, and you can go buy products the way you want. What imposes discipline on that is the profit and loss test, right? That if a business consistently suffered losses, it's going to shut down. And Mises said that's good. That's because the public is implicitly saying that they should be, uh, that those resources are more urgently needed elsewhere. International peace that Mises also pointed out, this isn't just a matter of domestic harmony and larger economic growth that if two countries side by side practice laissez-faire economic policy, there's no dispute really over resources. It's indifferent to your citizens whether an oil deposit 
is on this side of the border or that side if there's free trade, right? And you can buy shares of stock in a company in the other country too that owns that oil if you want. So this minimizes the hostility between nations. And so this isn't just a matter, like I say, of, of a higher standard of living. This also is a matter of minimizing war between states. And then the last thing that Mises pointed out was that it's the citizen's duty to learn economics. With other things like quantum physics, it doesn't matter if you think that's all bunk, right? The, sci the physicists and the chemists and computer scientists, they can still go make iPhones and you can buy them and see whether they work or not. It doesn't matter if you know how they work. But when it comes to economics, if the public supports price controls and thinks that, oh yeah, the reason we have shortages is because of the international money changers, not because of the government policies, you're gonna get bad outcomes. So let me leave you with a, a quote from Mises. There is no means by which anyone can evade his personal responsibility. Whoever neglects to examine to the best of his abilities all the problems involved voluntarily surrenders his birthright to a self-appointed elite of supermen. In such vital matters, blind reliance upon experts and uncritical acceptance of popular catchwords and prejudices is tantamount to the abandonment of self-determination and to yielding to other people's domination. As conditions are today, nothing can be more important to every intelligent man than economics. His own fate and that of his progeny is at stake. So no pressure, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.